Here in the hangar at the university, we've got our very own four-cylinder, four-stroke, horizontally opposed gasoline engine. And we can use this model, this cutaway model, for our BAK, our pre-PPL, and our CPL studies. During the class, we'll go through all the various components of the engine. But it's a good idea to come across here on your own and try and identify all the key components. The cylinder, the cylinder head, the rocker arms, the push rods, the springs, dual springs. Let's take a look at the four strokes of the auto cycle in this model. The piston is currently at top dead center at the commencement of the induction stroke. The induction port is just slightly open. The valve is just leaving the seat, allowing the mixture of fuel and air to enter the cylinder. The piston starts to move down the cylinder. The valve is fully open. And even when the piston reaches bottom dead center, the valve is still open. The piston is now starting to rise in the cylinder at the commencement of the compression stroke and the inlet valve is still slightly open. That's our valve lag. The piston is rising on the compression stroke. Both valves are now fully closed and just before we reach top dead center the spark plugs will ignite the mixture. By the time the piston gets to the top of its stroke, the explosion is well underway and that increase in pressure is now going to force this cylinder down the piston. Now remember, this is our only driving stroke. Both valves are still closed. As the piston starts to reach the bottom of the cylinder, you'll notice the exhaust port will start to open. There she goes. The piston is still traveling down the, the cylinder, but that valve has started to open. That's our valve lead. Now the piston is traveling up the cylinder, and that valve is almost fully open. Fully open now on our exhaust stroke, and now all the burned gases in the cylinder are now being scavenged through into the exhaust port. The piston continues up the cylinder and just as we reach that top dead center you'll notice the exhaust port is still slightly open. Now unfortunately because this model is only rotating at a paltry three or four revolutions per minute we're not going to see the valve overlap. If this model was rotating at 2400 RPM, which is 40 times per second, this valve would be opening and closing 20 times per second, and this valve would be opening and closing 20 times per second. And as this piston reaches top dead center, if we were to be able to take a snapshot in time, we would see that both of these valves would be slightly open. The exhaust valve would still be slightly open, scavenging the remaining of the exhaust gases, and the inlet port would be beginning to open, allowing fuel and air to begin its journey into the cylinder. And again, we'd be taking advantage of that ineffective crank angle. But sadly, on this model, you can't quite see that. So remember, the valve overlap is going to occur as the pistons traveling upwards on the exhaust stroke. So on the exhaust stroke towards the end, the inlet valve is beginning to open whilst the exhaust port is still slightly open. It's not until we get onto that induction stroke, a few degrees past top dead center on the induction stroke, that the exhaust valve will be fully closed.
And when we talk about valve clearance, what we're actually looking for here is the clearance between this rocker arm and the very top of the valve. And there would be a very, very small clearance there, which we would gauge by using some feeler gauges. Notice the two springs, and the two springs, the primary reason for those springs is to reduce, if not eliminate, valve bounce. You can see quite clearly the size of the intake port, which is quite large in comparison to the exhaust port, which is small in comparison. Here you can see the gudgeon pin, and here you can see the where the piston ring would be, the second piston ring, and the third being the oil control ring. Remember, the oil control ring's function is to allow a small amount of oil to travel up here and lubricate these two rings. The primary purpose of these two rings is to stop the fuel and air mixture traveling down into the oil sump. And of course, stopping the oil from traveling up into the cylinder where we'd be burning oil. That would be shown as blue smoke out of the exhaust. Look at all these fins that have been cast into the cylinder. These are to increase the surface area so as to cool the cylinder. We don't want the heat leaving the cylinder we want to keep as much heat in the cylinder as we practically can remember this engine is a heat engine we've taken the chemical energy out of the fuel we've converted that into heat energy and now that heat energy we want to convert into mechanical energy and we want that heat to be in the combustion chamber itself the more heat we get the bigger the pressure rise the more force on that piston and hence more power Here's our induction port, follow it through down through this pipe and this is going to be making its way down to an induction manifold to the carburetor. Let's continue to follow that pipe down and here it goes, there's four ports, one for each cylinder. This one's been cut away so you can see how the air and fuel would make its way up towards the cylinder. Here's the carburetor. It's called an updraft carburetor. Simple reason is air is drawn from the bottom and it's drawn into the carburetor through this hole. Now if you look through this hole where I'm placing the pencil there now, as I open the throttle you would see the butterfly valve begin to open. So at the moment the, the throttle is closed, there's the throttle open. You can quite clearly see the butterfly valve now in the Venturi. There's the butterfly valve fully open, so full throttle, closing the throttle, opening the throttle, and closing the throttle. Now here is the float. Remember this has been cut away so this part would come all the way around here and the fuel would be in this part here. When the float is up the, the bowl is full of fuel and as we open the throttle more fuel would be drawn into the Venturi and the valve the ball here would fall, it would open a valve and allow more fuel to flow into the float chamber. Here's the accelerator pump. Remember, as I quickly advance the throttle, I'm going to be drawing in a lot of air. The mixture is therefore going to change. We're going to go from maybe 12 to 1 to something like 20 to 1, which is too weak. I'm going to get a weak cut. So as I quickly advance the throttle open, this pump is going to force a small amount of fuel that's in there rapidly down through this pipe and this pipe would be connected 
to the Venturi part of the carburetor forcing more fuel into the Venturi as I rapidly open the throttle and that will bring the mixture down to something more sensible like perhaps maybe 12 to 1 so avoiding that weak cut on rapid accelerations obviously as I open the throttle slowly as we should do normally then there isn't enough force from this little accelerator pump it's on a spring and as a result we're not going to see as much fuel forced into the Venturi as I open the throttle slowly but as I open it quickly that will force the fuel into the Venturi here we can see the bottom spark plug here is the exhaust manifold port for one of the cylinders shown here is the oil sump remember here's the oil in here here's the dipstick so as I remove the dipstick that's what I'm measuring I'm actually measuring the level of the oil here and the manufacturers have decided that if that was the maximum the oil would be somewhere in that sort of position here's our stand pipe remember the pump is drawing oil the pump's position would be here and the pump would be rotating driven by the accessory gearbox or the accessory drive and the pump is forcing oil through this standpipe into the engine where it's going to be forced into various orifices under pressure. Unfortunately this model is not fitted with an alternator or a generator but we do have the starter motor fitted and it's been very nicely cut away so you can actually see the commutator you can see the armature, the very thick windings on the armature and you can see the gear here now remember as I rotate that whilst that gear is moving you'll notice that the crankshaft is not moving and that's because power hasn't been supplied to the starter motor and the solenoid has not pushed across the uh, gear mechanism to engage with the flywheel on the engine's crankshaft hopefully here you can see the gear on the left at the top the small gear is actually disconnected from the main larger gear to the right as we apply power to the starter motor the solenoid will push that small gear to the left across to the right and it will make contact with the larger gear when you release the key in the cockpit from the start position and the key springs back to the both position then that gear will return back to the left we have our left and right magneto remember the left magneto has the impulse coupling fitted to it this one has been cut away remember these are independent generators totally independent from the aircraft's electrical system they contain the primary coil, the secondary coil, the rotating magnet the contact breaker points, the capacitor and the grounding lead so here I'm showing you the left magneto and I'd like to talk about these little parts here on the impulse coupling now remember when the aircraft engine is rotating these poles here will be flung out into that direction and that's going to stop the spring from being wound up so as I rotate this engine now you're going to hear a clicking noise and that clicking noise you hear it it's a spring being wound up and the clicking is the release of the spring where the magneto is suddenly spinning at a reasonable speed about 120 rpm in an attempt to get the magnet rotating fast enough next to the primary coil here so it's going to induce an electromotor force in the primary coil which is going to be stepped up in the secondary coil which is part of this component also 
and as a result we're going to gain the high voltage required to run down these cables which in turn are going to go to our spark plug in the cylinder. So that's it, I've given you a very very quick overview of the four stroke horizontally opposed gasoline engine. We've looked at the auto cycle and various components on the engine. Make sure you come across, have a good look at the engine, try and identify the key components yourself, rotate the propeller, watch it working and it will give you a much deeper understanding of how this engine works and in time it will allow you to answer the questions you're going to be asked in the BAK and the CPL exams.